Right. What am I doing wrong? Got it. Got it. <laughs> okay. So uh, the uh, One Health is uh, something that we've been talking about for years now, and I might point out that during all those years here in Canada, we've been talking about One Health. We've been frustrated by the inability of us to move forward with respect to uh, dealing with antimicrobial resistance in Canada, but I'm not saying that the two are related. One Health uh, supposes that... Um, that there's a single universe for antimicrobial resistance and it includes human, animal and environment and that is not correct. These are separate universes with some overlap in some places and we need to understand that clearly if we're going to move forward with respect to dealing with this very important problem. The first issue that we have was dealt with very thoroughly by the previous speaker and that is the lack of evidence which really supports how uh, this One Health concept with respect to animals actually impacts on humans. And I would say to you that there are two questions, despite the fact that we have been working in One Health for all these years, that remain unanswered. The first is what proportion of antimicrobial resistance in humans is attributable to antimicrobial resistance in animals? We do not know the answer to that. I don't even know the range for that. And the second is do interventions to limit antimicrobial resistance in animals limit resistance in humans or make any difference with respect to human health? And I think that those are very important issues that must be answered and perhaps one of our goals should be to try and get some data that's useful for them. Well, let's move on then to the World Health Organization. They, uh, uh, they published a list of priority pathogens for R&D of new antibiotics in February of 2017. And uh, I list those here. So let's take a look at these priority pathogens and uh, how do they relate to One Health. <clears throat> First of all, uh, priority one, Acinetobacter baumami, Cinnamonas aeruginosa, CP resistance, Enterobacteriaceae, CP resistance. Yes, terrible organisms with respect to resistance, but these are not really pathogens except in individuals who are very immunocompromised. So it's, it's an issue um, for a certain type of uh, patient who are usually hospitalized, but I'm not sure that One Health is relevant to it. Enterobacteriaceae may have some relevance uh, to animals, but I don't think we know the, how much that is, and I certainly don't think we know how to approach it. Priority two, Ephicalis vancomycin resistance. Well, there's a long story about vancomycin resistance, and it's not ended yet, but I'm not sure that vancomycin resistance, as we see it as a problem, which is in highly immunocompromised patients who are in hospitals, is really related to animal use. MRSA, sure, animals get MRSA in humans, but most of the MRSA we see are human to human. Helicobacter pylori, um, uh, clarithromycin <coughs> resistant. So where you actually do see some likely impact across animals and humans, of course, are, are food-related uh, pathogens, Campylobacter species and Salmonella uh, being the most frequent. And so, yes, there are one or two here where one would think that perhaps there's uh, a, an argument for a One Health approach. And then Neisseria gonorrhea, of course, is entirely a human issue. And then we end up with priority three, Strep pneumonia and Haemophilus influenza. Uh, these are not animal issues. Shigella species, sure. I would point out here that tuberculosis is not on this list, and we would all agree that tuberculosis is very important with respect to resistance, but I understand that that's because the World Health Organization has other dedicated programs for tuberculosis and didn't feel that it needed to be added to this list where they were trying to deal with things that hadn't been handled. So then we talk about uh, the CDC also has an antibiotic resistant solutions initiative. They got $264 million in 2016. I don't know whether they've still got that money uh, for this, but uh, they suggested that they would be able to make an impact with respect to antimicrobial resistant infections with this money. And what you can see if you go down this list again, these are all human issues. C. difficile, healthcare, healthcare, bloodstream MRSA, invasive pneumococcal disease, MDR TB, MDR gonorrhea, salmonella is there. That's that food issue. And so, yes, maybe with salmonella, we do need to have some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of interaction between the animal and uh, the human people. But uh, this doesn't suggest to me that there's a large role for the One Health concept in uh, dealing specifically with these goals. And then let's go to the uh, Canadian uh, pan-Canadian uh, framework, which has just been published. I like this because it's sort of suggesting how they're going to approach it. And as you heard earlier today, uh, we surveillance, limit transmission with infection control, and for the human side, because that's what I'm talking about, uh, that would be acute care, long-term care, and in the community. And maybe in the community, there's some interaction. And again, we're talking about food. 
um, antimicrobial stewardship and innovation. I think my point here is simply that um, that the approaches on the animal side and the human side in terms of actually dealing with any of these issues are completely different, right? On the human side, somebody with a very resistant organism you're worried about, you do everything you can to keep them alive but keep other people from getting that. On the animal side, you have the option to slaughter the animal or slaughter the herd. So again, maybe we need to communicate, but I don't know that we necessarily need to approach the problem in the same way. So, I would say that One Health is an artificial construct. And as such, it, uh, a deal, it interferes with a discussion and with program development and is inefficient and likely misdirects some resources and duplicates some efforts. Um, I certainly agree that antimicrobial resistance and managing it is important and very complex, but One Health is too diffuse a concept to really help us move forward with respect to it. It's only a partially and perhaps only marginally correct in addition, and certainly we need far more information to help, uh, to help us. I would say that what we do need to move, I got it. What we do need to move forward <laughs> is, um, is to set very specific goals and we need roadmaps of how we're going to achieve those goals. And uh, we also need an awful lot more evidence on the interfaces between human, animal, and environmental health with respect to antimicrobial resistance. Now, in the interest of uh, optimizing use of my time, I'm going to uh, stick close to a script. Members of the affirmative, a distinguished colleague, ladies and gentlemen, there is no disagreement about the destination. We all wish to proceed as rapidly and as efficiently as possible to AMR Reduction Central Station. The question is which train or trains we take. The affirmative team would have you believe that the better choice is to take the congested bureaucratic One Health train, <laughs> despite the fact that it is still under construction, that there's considerable debate about how to construct it and who should be given tickets, and it is not on the right track to get us there. <clears throat> we, on the other hand, strongly support the plan to get us there by taking three trains that travel on different lines, trains with minimal baggage, that have been making good speed towards AMR Reduction Central Station. Trains with systems that permit passengers to transfer from time to time. Our argument is clear and straightforward. One Health is a complex concept which is still evolving. The concept was first stated centuries ago, had a version that was first popularized in North America in the late 19th and early 20th century by Canadian William Osler at McGill University who taught both veterinary students and human medicine. Then subsequently taken up by Calvin Schwabe at UC Davis who coined the term One Medicine. More recently, William Carrish uh, came up with the statement human or livestock or wild health can't be discussed in isolation anymore. There's just one health. He wasn't talking about applications and getting us somewhere. Health can be considered at the individual level, the group or population level, health of the public, or at the ecosystem level. Much of the focus today is on health at the population level. And we have public health systems that are well prepared to deal with health at this level. However, there's increasing recognition in the One Health movement that we need to go on to the next level and take an ecosystem perspective. But there's presently little provision or capacity for this. The concept of One Health is still in a stage of growth and modification. AMR reduction strategies should not be encumbered with the growing pains of this bureaucracy. This slide illustrates the state of continuing evolution as well as the political context of the One Health concept. Um, <clears throat> this is taken from the uh, One Health Initiative, which is one of a number of movements promoting One Health. And we can see clearly the political agenda, co-equal partnerships, all-inclusive collaborations among specific organizations, one Health, of 
course, involves numerous groups. And we've had several examples today of the complexity and enormity of this organization. And uh, the question is whether MR, which is itself a complex issue involving numerous organizations, can take on this kind of organization. MR reduction itself, again, involves numerous organizations. Um, in Canada, several provincial, several federal organizations, and of course, another layer um, taken by the provinces and territories. We were told that there were 28 ministers involved in a recent um, iteration of One Health. And we have people from health, agriculture, the environment, science, and so on. It's very complex. Necessarily so. The question is whether we can add another layer to that. One Health really started out as an approach towards zoonotic diseases. And the CDC, for example, talks about the rationale for a One Health movement. We've already indicated MR in animals is a minor contributor to the problem in humans. And the existing approach is working well in the sense that we've had a uh, reduction in many areas. I would urge you to not embark on a repeal, uh, repeal and replace approach, um, especially when we don't really have the system in place for uh, One Health uh, application. We're told that we need to strengthen human and animal health surveillance, monitor for resistant organisms, establish antimicrobial stewardship programs, infection control programs, development and approval of new antimicrobial agents, research on innovative therapeutics approaches, and development of rapid diagnostic tests and new vaccines. Not a single one of those requires One Health. Each of them can be done by the various organizations working independently. Thank you. Uh, we would like to thank our opponents. Uh, I know they don't believe in what they say. <laughs> and uh, it's very hard, but they're also incredibly well schooled in the art of debate. You've just heard how you can obfuscate any issue in the absence of data. <laughs> so uh, we think what we've talked about already has. Uh, rebutted their arguments because we presented data and we debated as to whether we would just tell, stand up and tell you that and then sit down. But I want to give you two other things. So this slide says, uh, what do these uh, two species of birds have in common other than the fact that they're obviously birds? Well, <clears throat> at least 80 species of wildlife, mostly birds, have been found to be carriers of ESBL, extended spectrum beta-lactamase uh, producing enterobacteriaceae. And you can look down this list and pick your favorite bird. And for those of you that love Canada geese when you're golfing, you recognize exactly what that means. <laughs> so the doctors, uh, Nicole and Giles, it's okay. Some people say there's no change in our climate either. That is unfair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we would uh, simply, in response to uh, the arguments, did I say arguments? They really didn't present arguments. Um, uh, they provided a lot of useful information, and much of the information, we're in agreement with the information. The question is, what do you do with it? How do you apply this? For example, we're told that it is important to have interventions getting at all the sources of AMU. And you can do that by having the individual areas get at the various interventions. We've been told here, we've had several examples in the discussions earlier, that there have been a lot of reports and reports and reports, but not much action. We've been slowed up by a terrible bureaucracy. Um, we can spend the next many years working on perfecting that bureaucracy, but this, these are resources that could be aimed at addressing the problems. The, the, the problem with um, antimicrobial resistance, especially in the animal sector, has been talked about, 
since the 1960s. The Swan Report in the UK told us to do some of the things we are now saying we are going to do. And uh, this has been a very, very slow progress. Uh, so we need to take all the resources we have and address the, the problem directly. The integration part of it, which is complex and is, may be useful. In fact, it may be that One Health will be ready 20 years from now to tackle this problem. They're not ready now. And so we need to not wait on them. So. <laughs> okay. um, we're told about the good things that can happen in uh, human health if we do things in animal health. But that doesn't require that one needs to integrate these two things. We can go ahead and do the things on the animal health, uh, veterinary medicine, agriculture side of things, and the results will show up in the human side without there being one health. So our point very clearly is that there are a lot of good things about one health, but it is slowing progress on uh, MR reduction, and we need to put it aside for the purposes of achieving our goals. Thank you.